Hello, everybody. This is uh, the introduction to the webinar on uh, the decriminalization of abortion in Mexico. And uh, this is a webinar organized by the series on Latin American uh, situations that is organized by the School of Global Studies in Gotham University. And to this particular webinar, we have also the cooperation of two organizations. One is GADIP, Gender and Development in Practice, an association working on gender issues that tries to put together academics and activists. And um, the Association uh, for Human Rights in Mexico, Ajacinapa for Human Rights in Mexico in Sweden. So these two associations together with the university are the organizers so, of the webinar. And as I said before, today's theme is uh, what is happening in Mexico regarding the uh, decriminalization of abortion. And we have invited a guest from an organization that has been working for a long time on these issues, this information group of um, reproductive uh, rights or reproductive, chosen reproductive rights. So, and this is Rebecca Lorea, who is their coordinator on the incidence of public policies. And she's going to speak uh, about these issues. She's going to present her organization. And this is a conversatory in which I introduce some questions and she develops the theme uh, according to these questions. So welcome, Rebecca. And uh, please introduce yourself and your organization. Hi, Edme, and thanks everybody for being here. And thanks for this invitation to HIRE, uh, the organization where I work. And I just wanted to let you know a little more about what we do on, on our daily work. We are a non-governmental feminist organization that was founded almost 30 years ago in 1992. And we've been working on reproductive rights for all these 30 years. The first 20 years, we were only working on abortion and it has always been like our main issue. But we are working uh, during the last 10 years, we've been working also other reproductive rights issues such as maternal mortality and obstetric violence and the work life balance and the assisted reproduction techniques and the, and the lack of regulation of assisted reproduction techniques and on contraceptives. What we do in, in HIRE, we have four main areas. One is the, the advocacy area in which I, I work. I, am, I coordinate that team. But we have also other teams, one litigation team that uh, litigates cases and we we've been also litigating some cases in the supreme court we have also a communications team and a research team that helps us um, being uh, helps us to monitor um, every day or every certain period of time how reproductive rights laws are being implemented or not implemented in in mexico so that's what we do, and that's why we are very happy and very interested in, in this process to the Supreme Court and other decriminalization processes in Mexico. Thank you, Rebecca. And now I would like to ask you to give us a context, a background to what is happening today. Yes, I, I guess this, this conversation is about this Supreme Court decision, but it is important to know what is the, the legal context in which the Supreme Court's decision arrived? And that context is that Mexico is a federal state. We have a constitutional arrangement that we have 32 states and each one of those states has its own legislative power and has the, the faculty to decide which uh, which things are a crime and which things are not. And one, each one of these 32 states have its own criminal code 
and in practically all the criminal codes or criminal laws of each state, abortion, it is still a crime. We have a little uh, graphic about this. I'm going to share it with you. Here are all, all Mexico's states are 32. This is like the our country. So we have all these 32 states and each one of them has different criminal laws. But what they are, they all have in common is that abortion is as a general rule, a crime. There are states like Mexico City or Hidalgo or Oaxaca that, or Veracruz that have um, different uh, legislations and in, in their own legislations, their criminal codes uh, don't see abortion as a crime as, as long as it is performed within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. But then we have other states such as Guanajuato, is this state where I was born and raised, where abortion, it is a crime always, and it will, all, not, it will not be a crime only after, uh, if it's an abortion performed of, after a, a pregnancy that it's a consequence of violence, of sexual violence, or if it is because of some recklessness uh, attitude or, or conduct of, of the women or the pregnant person. But as you can see in this, in this graphic, um, women in, in Mexico have more or less rights depending on the state where they live or their capacities of moving to another state where uh, abortion is legal or, or abortion laws are a little more uh, loosened. We have- Rebecca, Can you tell us what the different colors mean? Yes. Uh, as you see, there is a, a number on, with, on each state. We have uh, the, the red colors are like the most restrictive laws on abortion. Uh, this is uh, uh, like a balance that we made in here. For example, in, in the case of Oaxaca, Veracruz, Hidalgo and Ciudad de Mexico, all these four states have uh, abortion as not as a crime in their criminal codes within the first 12 weeks of gestation. But the difference between Mexico City and Hidalgo with Oaxaca and Veracruz is that Mexico City and Hidalgo have in their health laws, um, abortion as a service of public health. And in the case of Veracruz and where Oaxaca, like the last week <laughs> changed its, its local health law. But in the case of Veracruz, uh, their, their local health laws don't say nothing about abortion. So it is not a crime, but it is not yet uh, public service. It is not yet the, the possibility of the health ministry of Veracruz to perform abortions as a public health service because it is not, there is not like a program or a public policy stated in their, in their local laws. And that does happen in Mexico City in which from 2007, where abortion was decriminalized also, the health law was reformed and there is a, a program on the interruption of pregnancy that it is a, a public service in which any women, uh, practically any women from all the country can come to Mexico City to have an abortion. But that wasn't a possibility in, in Oaxaca until last week and in Veracruz it is still not. So it's, uh, that's why they are yellow and not green and that's why all other states are like red because abortion it is a crime and they don't even have this 12 weeks gestation uh, like period of time where, where it is not. And the oranges one are the ones that, uh, for example, Michoacán, 
Pakistan that have more exceptions to abortion as a crime, which we have the exceptions over here. It's abortion after rape, abortion of, for recklessness, when there is a risk of dying, where, where there is a risk of, of um, health um, complications, where there is uh, genetic issues on, on the product, or where there is uh, artificial insemination, is, is that the, the correct word, that is unconsented, or where there are socioeconomical causes. And that's why these states are, are in red. And we, we don't have, this is like a zero and a hundred scale. And even though that Mexico City and Hidalgo have the, the, the less restrictive laws within all Mexico, we still think that 12 weeks of gestation are, are not enough. And that's why they don't have like a hundred percent like number or, or qualification because 12 weeks are okay. They are like the, the maximum or the, the less restrictive context in, in Mexico, but they are not enough. We, we need that like, the total decriminalization of abortion to have these states and all of them eventually uh, with a hundred, uh, yes, with, with a qualification of a hundred or like a 10 or like the best qualification. So this is the context. And this one that I am pointing right now is the state of Coahuila. It is actually the frontier with Texas. The Texas is over here. And it is in this state that has a restrictive abortion laws, such as a lot of others, where they changed their criminal code in 2017, but they kept abortion as a crime. And it was after this reform and this legislative procedure that um, it started a new mechanism or not a new mechanism, but that the federal attorney's office promotes this constitutional control mechanism that is the action of a constitutionality and that got us to the Supreme Court decision last September. Even though abortion after rape is, it is not a crime and it is actually a right for every, every victim of rape, we've been also facing several obstacles for women and girls to access to abortion after rape. And those obstacles are mostly about the, the health institutions and the health personnel who do, doesn't want to perform an abortion. And so they are just like denying it. And we have our, our numbers on the research that we've been doing in, in Hire. We've found that in periods like 10 years, we uh, health institutions only report less than 200 abortions performed in, in a period of 10 years. In a place like Mexico, where we know that sexual violence is a um, very, very problematic issue. So even though abortion after rape and after mm. all this is legal, mm -hmm. we have... Uh, already obstacles to, to access to it. Um, we have also, as, as background uh, of, of the Supreme Court decision, another Supreme Court decision, which are part of this legal framework of, of abortion in Mexico. And those, those decisions that are, the, the first of them is from 2008, where after Mexico City decriminalized abortion within the first 12 weeks of, of pregnancy, the National Commission on Human Rights and the Federal Attorney's Office promoted an action of unconstitutionality to the Supreme Court, which is a, a mechanism of constitutional control here in, in Mexico. And it's also the same mechanism that uh, got us to the resolution of September, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about that later. But we have a history also in the Supreme Court decision, in Supreme Court decisions that all of them have been towards protecting women's rights and towards advancing reproductive rights and, and the criminalization of abortion. In this decision of 2008, 
the Supreme Court stated that decriminalization of abortion within the first weeks of pregnancy, the, the first 12 weeks, was constitutional. But on that moment, the Supreme Court didn't enter on what are or, or what, what were the obligations of states. The Supreme Court only stated that states can decriminalize abortion if they want, and they will be uh, in, in acting like under the constitution. But if they don't want to, then they can just stay like that. So uh, that is one of the main reasons for which after 2007, that uh, the Mexico City decriminalized abortion, we have to wait, to wait 12 years to have another state to decriminalize abortion, which was Oaxaca from 2007 to 2019. And it was only after 2019 and until now 2021 that other two states, um, other Congress, local Congresses and, and legislators got to decriminalize abortion in Hidalgo and Veracruz. And this has also a lot to do with social movements and the green tide social movement that started in, in Argentina, but then got to practically all Latin America. Uh, and Mexico, of course. And yes, I think that's like the general <laughs> background and legal yes. of abortion in, in Mexico. Mm. And you just mentioned the Supreme Court uh, resolution and which is the, 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 the main theme of this lecture. And we would like you to analyze what is the significance of this resolution? Uh, what is the impact it's have, it is having in the country at large? Yes, uh, what happened that, that got us to the Supreme Court's decision, it was that in 2017, the state of Coahuila, which I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna show you the state of Coahuila, is this one over here, the state of Coahuila in 2017 got to a new criminal code. They made a whole new criminal co uh, code. Here's the state of, I oh know, close it, sorry. They uh, made a new criminal co uh, code and instead of decriminalizing abortion, they, uh, they uh, didn't move uh, practically anything. They, they got, uh, they still consider abortion as a crime. And they, of course, uh, stated that abortion after rape wasn't a crime or after uh, because of risk to health of women and stuff. But they didn't decriminalize abortion like uh, on 12 weeks of gestation, such as in, in Mexico City. So after that legislative process, the federal attorney's office promoted an action of unconstitutionality that the uh, uh, constitutional mechanism can only be uh, resoluted by the Supreme Court. And, and they promoted this action of unconstitutionality by arguing that the state of Coahuila was um, violating women's rights by criminalizing abortion and only allowing it because of these certain circumstances. So that, that's the background of the Supreme Court's dissolution, resolution. And what the Supreme Court stated in last September, it was historical, uh, historical in, in, in many ways. One of those ways was because it, it is the first time a Supreme Court in not only in Mexico, but I think in all Latin America states not only that the criminalization of abortion is constitutional, but that criminalization of abortion is unconstitutional. So we move forward to that 2008 decision that stated, you know, states, if, if you want to decriminalize, go for it. If you don't want to, then it's okay. Now we moved to another place in which the Supreme Court said, you states, all these 32 states are uh, going against the constitution by having abortion criminalized. So you have to, to uh, reform or your criminal codes to decriminalize abortion because um, decriminalization of abortion 
is unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court got to this conclusion after making um, several analyses, and all of them are great human rights arguments and human rights analysis. Um, also, there are um, arguments more, more um, how can I say, like more steady to, to reality, because right now in Mexico, we have abortion criminalized in paper and in criminal codes, but we know that there are not that much women in jail and there are not, uh, criminalization doesn't always ends to women in jail because they are they are having abortion, which happens in other countries such as El Salvador or Nicaragua. That in Mexico we don't have that, but we have all this access, all, all these obstacles to access to abortion, even when it is legal. And that is because criminal codes are still in like the general rule is that abortion is a crime. So that uh, goes to everyone's head and it, it turns into an obstacle to access to abortion even when it's legal. And so the, the Supreme Court got to this conclusion after real interesting analysis and arguments of women's rights and of our right to have our life projects and of our right to health, of our right to integrity. Um, the I think the, the discussion is only in Spanish, but it was, a really interesting discussion. And it was also historical because all 11 of, um, justices in, in the Supreme Court agreed in this decision. The, their, uh, their, this, this decision wasn't like this, this cardiac <laughs> discussion in which we don't know if, if the next uh, justice is going to, to vote in favor of our rights or not, because practically all of them agreed that criminalization of abortion is unconstitutional. So it, it was a very rich discussion, a, a very nice discussion of a right. And another historical thing that happened in this discussion, it was that the Supreme Court not only talked about women, not only about women's rights, but that it moved into uh, another way of, of speaking that included not only cisgender women, but also trans people. And also trans people who are not women, but who can get pregnant and who can, um, who can have the uh, necessity of an abortion and a safe abortion. So the Supreme Court really, really moved forward. And this is historical because uh, a lot of organizations, we've been working from, before 2007, where, where criminal, uh, abortion was decriminalized in Mexico City, and a lot of legislative actors and, and stakeholders have been like le legitimizing their lack of, of, uh, of work towards women's rights because there wasn't like an, a, a sentence or a judgment as, as clear as this one that the Supreme Court has, has stated. What is now in, in like uh, blurry is that the, the Supreme Court has this decision and they issue that they make public the, the project of, of the resolution, but the final resolution, it, is, it hasn't been published. And so in the discussion, we could see like they, they all agree that criminalizing abortion totally was a crime, but they didn't speak about when uh, they, they were very clear by saying there has to be a period in pregnancy in which women can decide over their own bodies without asking for permission to anyone. But they didn't say if there was a period during pregnancy in which women cannot uh, decide on their pregnancy. I'm, I'm, I don't know. There wasn't a conversation about at how many weeks of pregnancy can women decide and how many weeks can, can women not to decide and go to under these uh, other circumstances. So we don't know if in the final resolution, the Supreme Court is going to enter to this, to this discussion. But we are um, our perspective is that the the arguments and the like the, the whole body of the resolution is enough 
to all these 32 or at least 28 legislative powers in each state to move forward and decriminalize abortion, at least within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, such as in Mexico City and Oaxaca and Hidalgo and Veracruz. But we can also move on from that uh, 12 weeks because we know that 12 weeks are not always enough and women have the necessity of abortions even after 12 weeks and that has to be guaranteed by state authorities. So yes, that's a little about the what happened in the Supreme Court. Very good. So what have been the consequences of this, the repercussions since this uh, resolution took place? And what would be the next steps to uh, finally get a, a general decriminalization of abortion in the whole country? What do you think? Um, well, I, I think that um, talking about the, what were the consequences, we can have consequences like in, in both sides from people that we uh, are working for women's rights and, and for abortion rights, but also for uh, from people that are not um, like women's rights or, or pro-choice movements and there are like pro-life or anti-rights movements. So for, for from those people and, and those groups, the anti-rights movement or pro-life, so-called pro-life movements, we haven't seen yet uh, like real consequences only that they are uh, exercising the right to, to protest. In last October 3rd, there was uh, a lot of, uh, there were a lot of protests in, in a lot of cities against the Supreme Court decision, but it is practically impossible to, to uh, like going against the Supreme Court decision legally. And the consequences in, in the feminist movement and in, in pro-choice actors and stakeholders, we are watching well, for feminist movements, I think, and, and the green tide movement in, in Mexico and, and in Latin America, we think uh, we're very happy because we are finally heard. <laughs> and we, we've been heard like in some leg legislative powers, but we, we've never been heard as, as such as as um, men and as our, our, all of our rights, uh, only the, as we got to the Supreme Court. And one of the consequences is in September 28th, which is the International Day of Mobilization for Abortion Rights in, in Latin America, already two senators, two women and, and feminist historical feminist senators promoted and, and they presented a bill on reproductive rights and access to abortion, to decriminalize abortion in the federal criminal code, and also to uh, reform the general uh, health law or general law of health to make abortion uh, a health service and to guarantee that all women in, in throughout the country can access to an abortion under each state circumstances, but also within the first weeks of gestation in practically the whole country. And we've been also, this is like uh, really formal consequences when some senator and, and some legislative actors already feel like supported by the, the, the Supreme Court decision and are moving forward, not only to, to present bills on the first 12 weeks of gestation, but also to present bills to guarantee the access to abortion in, in public health institutions. And we know that a lot of, well, we had elections last June. And uh, after those elections, these uh, September, October, November, new legislative powers are, are getting into their, their work and, and starting the new legislators. And we know that lots of them have the purpose of presenting bills and to, to work in their own legislative, uh, with their legislative um, colleagues to move to decriminalize abortion, not only in two weeks, but, but more. Uh, we have currently 
like formally presented bills in, in Quintana Roo, in, in Durango, a feminist movement uh, made their own bill and they got to the Congress of, of Durango, which is a um, state in the north of Mexico, to search in that any, any legislative, uh, that the legislative move forward and, and got to reform their criminal code. We have also in the state of Sinaloa, which is at the west of Mexico, like the central west of Mexico, um, uh, a bill that seeks to decriminalize abortion like totally, that abortion doesn't exist in the criminal code. No, they are not talking about weeks and about circumstances, but abortion to, to not be on Sinaloa's criminal code. And yes, we're hoping that lots and, and all these 30 new Congresses after the June elections and after the Supreme Court decision move forward to decriminalize. And all, I think also one of the consequences is that, is that feminist movements have to refresh our, our work after we, we feel hurt. And it's also a moment to articulate ourselves. And also after this Supreme Court's decision, there is a new opportunity to litigate cases. And we, we haven't seen yet new, new litigation strategies because the final resolution, the final text of the, of the resolution hasn't been published. But after it is published, we, I think we're gonna see lots of different litigation strategies and those litigation strategies can also be a way to advance in the criminalization of certain states. So yes, it's good news for abortion and women's rights in Mexico. Thank you, Rebecca. So you have given us a panorama which is quite interesting and quite broad regarding the context and, the, and now that the new possibilities that are being created for this uh, decriminalization. And you, you mentioned as well that um, the feminist movement is celebrating this, uh, but I would like to ask, is, is there any discussion regarding new strategies within the feminist movement to continue on this? Um, yes, you know, the feminist movement here in Mexico and I think everywhere, we are really diverse. And I think the first important and I would say uncomfortable discussion was after the Supreme Court's uh, public discussion and the, the, the justice's decision of talking not only about women, but also talking about gender non-conforming people or people who can get pregnant or pregnant people um, like looking after trans men and non-binary people who can get pregnant and who have also the right to abortion. There was a discussion in, in a, you know, it's, it's an old discussion on feminist movements, the, the inclusion of trans people or, or non-inclusion. So there was like <laughs> some discussion mostly in social media about how are the justices, uh, talking about something that, or some people that are not women, if women are the only, um, the only one who have right to abortion. But I think that uh, has, that or, or happened only in, in social media, but I think the Supreme, if the Supreme Court is talking about gender non-conforming people and people who can get pregnant, then it's like, I can't believe that the Supreme Court is <laughs> like more progressive than, than uh, the whole feminist movement, right? And I think that was one of their discussions, but at the end, the, the thing that, that um, we are together, uh, all, the whole feminist movement that we are together is the, the access to abortion. So that, I think that was like uh, a discussion that um, stayed in, in, the, like in the shallow, uh, because then we, we went to celebrate. And another discussion, I think it has to do with, with the strategies that we know, like everyone, the, the whole feminist movement, and I, I'm not talking about the whole feminist, like I'm, 
I'm not rep a representative of the whole feminist movement. I'm a white woman who lives in the capital of the country and work in a large organization, so I cannot speak on her name. But I do know by some exchanges that we've had with women and feminist movements in, in other states of the country, that there is a lot of expectation on how is, is going the Supreme Court, if, if the Supreme Court is going to enter in, in period of pregnancy and what, what will be the strategies after that. I think the, the discussion is, is more on strategies than on, on the impact. We, we all agree that it, this has a lot of impact, but we haven't talked enough about what strategies are we going to state after this, because there is a lot of confusion and this confusion is also um, beat by some media, local, national, and even international media that went out to say, Supreme Court decriminalized abortion in Mexico, which it is not true. The Supreme Court only held that it is unconstitutional to criminalize abortion, but all those criminal codes in all those 32 states are still there. The Supreme Court didn't, didn't erase all those criminal courts and said, you know, that this is not only a law because it is unconstitutional. That is not the way um, that Mexican law and, and Mexican constitution works. So all those uh, laws in all those states are still there, but it is, it is difficult and to understand that it uh, generate a lot of confusion in, in a lot of feminist movements, we in Hide have been trying to, to make a lot of spaces like this to explain what are the, the consequences of, the, of, the, of this decision, but uh, like stating and being clear that this decision didn't decriminalize abortion throughout the country. It only opened one door and, and a window or and new opportunities to move forward. So the discussion I think is, it's happening, but it's only it's all, uh, as well. It's blurry because we we don't know yet exactly what the Supreme Court with will help in their uh, final resolution. But that what we at least in in within the conversations that we've had is, is that we all agree that twelve weeks are not enough. That we want to move forward for twelve weeks after. After the decriminalization of abortion in Mexico City in 2007 that decriminalized in these 12 weeks of gestation, it was like that model that we, we feminist movements have been pushing for almost 15 years. But after the Supreme Court decision, we are having conversations that 12 weeks are good, are the minimum, but we need more. Uh, we, we want more than 12 weeks and I, we deserve more and we think it is our right to have more weeks and the the reality and the women that uh, for example we in here litigate their cases we know that 12 weeks are not enough and we want to move forward we still don't know at how many weeks we're going to move because we don't know the the final resolution but we want to move for, from those 12 weeks. And like we, we have a new horizon that wasn't possible under the constitutional interpretations uh, 12 or two months ago, that is the complete decriminalization of abortion as in this state of Sinaloa already, someone got to this idea and presented a bill when where abortion, it is not a crime. It is a, a, the word abortion, it, it doesn't exist in there in their criminal code in this, in this bill. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, uh, we are waiting for all the people to formulate their questions, but we have a question here that started quite early. And the question is regarding abortion being allowed after rape, how is the rape proven? Or what does the woman need in order to access abortion after rape? Yes, it's a, a great question. Um, well, abortion after rape is legal in Mexico since the last century because it, it was stated in all criminal uh, codes. But most or, or some of those criminal codes stated that um, to 
for abortion after rape to not be a crime, it needed to be authorized by the attorney's office or authorized by a judge, or it had to be performed under the first week, weeks of gestation, or in, in case of people and, and women under a under 18, that they had they needed their, their parents' permission. So feminist movements and human rights movements. Uh, in knowing that this this was what ha what happened in paper, and that when women seek abortion after rape in health institutions, they got to these obstacles. We have a, a very interesting case that got to the Inter American um, Commission of Human Rights, which was the Paulina case, and I think that is the the example part of the history of how abortion after rape after rape is uh, regulated right now. Because in the Paulina case, Paulina was an adolescent, uh, 13 years adolescent, who was raped. She had a pregnancy uh, as a consequence of, of this rape. And even though that the criminal code allowed to have an abortion, when she seeked an abortion on their health institutions, she and, and her mom, uh, the health institution started like putting obstacles because they could. They uh, put a lot of obstacles like, no, you, you need that a judge to authorize this. No, look at this video. And they, they uh, subjected her to uh, a, a lot of practically torture. And so the pregnancy got too far and she, she wasn't, she, she ended up having birth and having a kid. So this case got to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and to a... Uh, friendly uh, agreement. And after this, one of the comprehensive reparation of this agreement was to have a normal, uh, um, or some <laughs> a law stated to uh, health institutions to tell the health institutions what to do when they get uh, like a Paulina, when they get, when any women get to a health institution and ask for abortion after rape. So that uh, took us to, uh, it, it is in Spanish called the Norma Oficial Mexicana or a NOM um, 46, which is a, a, the regulation for health institutions to what to do when, when they got, uh, when some victim of rape got to them. But this, uh, this norm 46 still stated in 2009, when, when it was issued for the first time, that health institutions needed to have an authorization to perform an abortion after rape. And so it was until 2016 that because of women's rights movements and feminist movements and human rights movements, that we got to remove this uh, requirement of this norm. And so today, uh, women and adolescents who want an abortion after rape, they only need uh, like a written declaration that they have a pregnancy and though that pregnancy is a result of rape and they are asking for an abortion. So that is what is stated in like in paper, but we know there is a gap for the access. And right now it, that, uh, that permission of abortion after rape only by a written declaration, it is a right for every adolescent from 12 years on. Because we know that lots of the victims of rape in Mexico, mostly the, the under 18 victims of rape are victims from their own parents or their own relatives. So we removed the requirement of having a relative permission to uh, for, for their children to have an abortion because we know that relatives and, and parents are in, in lots of cases in, involved in these um, violence situations. So that practically there are no requirements. The only requirement is to have uh, a written declaration. But it, this is like the history. We got to this after Paulina case. We got to this after a lot of different cases. And that is, I think we think that regulation over that current framework, it is it is okay, but what it is not okay is the, the access. We have 
a lot of obstacles in, in real life to access to abortion after rape. Thank you. We have uh, some other questions here. What are the lessons that Mexican organizations that fight for abortion rights learn from other countries struggle for human rights? And how can we build coalitions across the countries? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we all learn in not only in Mexico, but in a lot in America, the importance of social movements. Um, I think there was, uh, there has always, or at least from the last century to date, there has always been feminist organizations and feminist actors that work with institutions and that are like HIDA itself, that are making research and arguments to move forward on abortion. But um, as, as a social movement to which, which uh, demand, like clear demand is a decriminalization of abortion, we didn't have that until 2018. And we learned that from the Argentina movement that mm -hmm fill the streets with, it, it, it was a conversation that not only was happening within institutions, that it was not only happening within feminists who have contacts with institutions or not happening only in the Supreme Court or only in the, in the Senate or only in, in these institutional places, but it was a conversation that got to the streets and got to everyone's houses and everyone's relationships. And we learned that from the, uh, from the green tide in Argentina and we got, or the green tide got to Mexico. And from 2018, we at least um, some organizations like Gire and other feminist organizations like Balance and the Simone de Beauvoir Institute uh, are trying to make spaces for activists to articulate and also to move uh, or, or make the movement for the abortion not to be only in Mexico City, which also had, had happened a lot in, in Mexico history, that the, the movement and the decisions and everything happened in Mexico City, which is like this part of the whole territory. <laughs> and it is far away from lots of ter like the, the other uh, extremes of the territory. And we're trying to move that conversations and to bring them to all throughout the country and throughout the spaces, not only laws, not only institutions, but only, uh, but also to like my parents, my friends, the people where I uh, like the public transport or everywhere, and to yes, like to to be a movement and to be a demand that we can all be identified with, and and not only these like um, arguments of political uh, arguments and, and things that happen only somewhere else, but to build a social movement. I think that that is a great lesson. And it is a lesson that also in, in the Supreme Court decision was, was uh, presented because the, the president, the justice president of the Supreme Court made like this discourse and this speech after the discussion in which mentioned specifically the Green Tide movement and mentioned that uh, the Supreme Court was also making these decisions by hearing the Green Tide. And we think that is um, a lesson that we have, we, we learned from other countries. And also a, a lesson that we learned from, well, this case, maybe Argentina, but other, other countries as well is to move forward on, on our speeches and our arguments and to talk about abortion in a more positive way. Because historically we've been hearing that abortion is this tragically thing that happened to women and the most difficult decision and like the last resource for all women. And we, we've been also thinking about how to speak of abortion as something that happens every day and that happens to a lot of women. And it, it doesn't have to be this tragic decision, doesn't have to be the as resource of women because we know that for some women is their first resource. Women, when they know they're pregnant, they 
uh, they easily know that they don't want to have a child. And so we are also moving forward on our speeches and moving forward on talking about abortion as a reproductive process that happens in everyday life. And it is a normal reproductive process and it has to be treated as such and not as a crime. There's, there's another question. Is there a concern in Mexico about the future of the courts and upholding recent and future decisions about abortion rights? For example, with the rise in conservative movements I am from Texas and watching in horror as the states pass the law that has been upheld by federal judges and is on the way back to the Supreme Court with an uncertain outcome. Yes, I think that fear and that risk when we talk about women's rights is like permanent. We are celebrating now, but we know that when when we talk about women's rights, there is always the risk of, of going backwards. And we actually have, uh, in I think in November, a, a justice is gonna end its, uh, his period and we're gonna have in January or in, in the end of this year, an election of, of another justice. And um, yes, we hope and, and in, in recent elections of, of justices or, or designation, abortion has been key in their, mm -hmm. in, their in, in, in deciding to, to be justices or not. But I, I'm, I'm not sure if we, I don't know, <laughs> we don't want to think about that. Um, I think uh, the Mexican president, which as, as, in, as it happens in the US has a lot of of power to, to decide. It is not his decision, his final decision to choose a justice, but we know that in like in political and in practice it, it happens, such as in, in the US. But the, the president has chosen or has been involved in, in the designation of the last three justices, and they all had happened to be progressive justices, at least in abortion issues. But we, I, I myself, this is not institutional, I myself have uh, another lecture of, of the Supreme Court decision, and it is that there are uh, other issues pending in the Supreme Court related to militarization and related to big presidential projects that go against environmental, um, fights and environmental issues. And I think maybe the Supreme Court has chosen to um, make these decisions in favor of women's rights, but other decisions not in favor of, of human rights generally. I think it's, it's, it has been like a, a political balance and, and a political strategy to, to, of the Supreme Court maybe to legitimize itself uh, using, as we know, it happens a lot, using women's rights and reproductive rights, but on the other hand, going backwards in other human rights issues, such as um, environmental issues and uh, militarization issues in, in Mexico. But that is only um, an hypothesis of, of mm -hmm. myself. And uh, I, I, I don't know if in the future we've had, um, we will have a Supreme Court as, as in the US, we hope. Not. Another question, how likely is it that other states like Chiapas, Coahuila, eh, will loosen restrictions or remove them altogether for access to abortion the way they did in Oaxaca and Veracruz? I think this is something to consider with the recent pay, pay passage of this, uh, the same SB8 in Texas. Mexico has lots of medical tourists from Americanas already especially in border states, but women in Texas will not have access to abortion, it are, but are literally minutes from the Mexican border. Yes, um, I don't know if in the, in the state of Coahuila happened something like curious because the, the Supreme Court stated that it was unconstitutional, their, their article, so practically those specific articles that criminalize abortion are like not already law. They, they are invalid. They, they should not be applied in, in anywhere. Um, but 
the, the local Congress and the, and the local legislative uh, power doesn't want to move nothing. It's like they, they are um, something like saying, well, the Supreme Court did our job, so we are not doing anything else. And it, it is like bittersweet because yeah, the Supreme Court did a lot, but also the, the Congress has to do something to guarantee access um, to abortion and to put it in, in, their, in their local health law. And in other states like Chiapas, I, I don't know, Chiapas is a, a, very, a very complicated state. And that the, the possibility to move forward in one state or another, it depends completely for, uh, of political powers. And in, the, in our balance, in our, um, in our experience, we've seen that um, Morena is the only political party that has been key to move forward on the um, criminal codes reform, at least in Oaxaca, Veracruz, and Hidalgo. And so maybe the states in which Morena has a majority of their legislative are those states in, in which we can move forward. But in, there are other states as Guanajuato, Nuevo León, or Chihuahua, where conservatives have the power in their local congresses. And we know that they are not going to move one finger towards uh, the criminalization of abortion. So it, it depends a lot of political powers. But what, uh, one thing that I, I haven't said in, in, in all this lecture is that we have also a very strong movement of, I don't know with uh, escorts or companions or how would you say it may like abortion doulas in Mexico? Uh -huh. Yes, people who go together with the, uh -huh. if you can explain, yes. Yes, there, there is a uh, like a strong movement of women who, uh, who provide abortions or, or who provide medicines and for women to have their abortions at home. Yes, abortion doulas. And so it is in those states like Chiapas or like Nuevo León or Guanajuato where abortion doulas are key because even though they have like the, the menace of being criminalized, we know that in practice they, they are not criminalized. They are not in jail. They are not being... Um, like research or in, in criminal investigations. And they are a, a really important support for women who want to have an abortion. Uh, and as long as they are in the, in the first weeks where they can have an abortion with um, medicine in, in, in their homes. Mm -hmm. And also for women who doesn't have the, who don't have the, the capacities or the power to move ne neither to Mexico City or Hidalgo or Veracruz, and so they they are really supported by these abortion doulas. And in a, a, a last question, because the time is finishing. Uh, thank you for a great conversation. My question is, um, how is the resistance opposition from the church articulated? Um, they are articulated mainly in the in the public space. We have this uh, October third, like massive protests in, in which actually something horrible happened because they had like a 15 year old adolescent who was who had a, a, an advanced pregnancy and they performed an ultrasound an, an ultrasonido mm -hmm. in, a, in, in the middle of a public protest and they uh, they were uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Como que estaban proyectando el ultrasonido. They were projecting this ultrasound examination. Oh. Uh -huh. They were like, yeah, watch, this This is life and abortion shall be the same. <sighs> they have always been really articulated and they have a lot of money, they have a lot of power, but I think that they are going to move now within the uh, the, the, the social things and not, not the, the legal, although formal strategies, but the, the social strategies and with misinformation, I think that that is their, their key strategy right now, because I, I don't see how legally or constitutionally they can 
um, do something different within within the laws, but they they will always have the public space and uh, and, and stuff. We know in Colombia there are efforts to state like the right, the human right to be born or something, <laughs> which is a, a little. <laughs> But we, we don't know if their strategy will go like something over there, but they, I, I think their strategy is and always will be to take the public space and it is difficult to attack that. Mm. Okay, Rebecca, this, is, this has been extremely interesting and very informative. And I think that we have made the most of the time um, and uh, I can tell all our public here that we are going to um, uh, put this recording in the uh, in the uh, web page of Gadib and perhaps also in the web page of Ayotzinapa, so you can all look at it afterwards. And I want to thank you, um, Rebecca and Hire, for bringing us all these informations and uh, this analysis, what is happening in Mexico, which is very, very important in this um, continental struggle to fight uh, against this criminalization of abortion. So thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and thank you everybody who was here. And uh, I just want to say that uh, within the series of Latin America, we are going to continue with all the webinars. I'm going to send invitations for the next one, which is going to be about Peru. So thanks again, Rebecca, and see you, oh, thank in, you. in a near future, I hope, everybody. Yes, I hope that too. Okay, thank see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.